Hello, everybody, and welcome to Performance, the first virtual summit organized by Launchmetrics to discuss the future of brand performance in fashion, luxury, and beauty industries. First of all, thank you for joining us today in this session. Um, this session will focus on the art of benchmarking. And speaking on this topic, we have our lovely CMO, Alison Branger. The session is 30 minutes long, and if we have questions at the end, we'll be taking some. So please don't hesitate to participate in the live chat the real-time polls, and share the experience on social media through the hashtag Performance2020. And so with that said, Allison, I guess I'll pass it off to you. Hi, thanks so much, Catherine, and great job on the branche. I know, uh, you know, you got scolded for that yesterday during rehearsal, so it seems like it came through. <laughs> Um, I, I'm so happy to be here. As Catherine said, I am the Chief Marketing Officer at Launchmetrics. Um, I'm just loading up my presentation to share with you guys. Uh, let's just do this. And for those of you that haven't had time to get to know Launchmetrics, we are the leading brand performance cloud for fashion, luxury, and beauty. We've been working in the industry for more than a decade, and you can see some of our fantastic clients up on the screen, as well as our various partners within the industry. And what we do at Launchmetrics is that we provide these brands, these partners, the tools and data they need to create inspiring, impactful, and measurable brand experiences. So I'm sure you've joined a lot of the different sessions throughout the day, and you've heard about you know, how people are building brand performance, and that's essentially what we do through our tools and intelligence at Launchmetrics. So today I really wanna focus on you know, benchmarking, and how we are helping brands and how brands are benchmarking themselves. So let's dig into it. You know, it's an exciting time now in marketing. And I think that some of you joining in are probably not thinking it's an exciting time in marketing because you're thinking it's a crazy time in the world, right? Uh, there is so much happening in this kind of pandemic uh, or mid pandemic moment, there are still lockdowns happening across Europe, um, chaos everywhere, I don't know. But I guess I, I would say I'm maybe more of an optimist, right? There's a lot of silver linings happening out there for us as marketers, and I kind of wanted to take a few minutes to, to touch on that. You know, the topic at hand is benchmarking, standing out in a crowd, and as you can see here, there's a lot of great logos on this screen, but it's really hard to think about how you're gonna stand out from all of your competitors. And as I was saying, at this moment, you know, it's an exciting time in marketing, but I do understand that for some of us, you know, budgets have been frozen, um, and it, it feels challenging. But one kind of silver lining you can see is that I, and I believe our CEO spoke about this this morning. There has been months of uh, or years of digital transformation that's happened in just months, and it's incredible. You know, so many companies that are doing marketing and doing it smart right now at this moment are taking those marketing dollars and reinvesting them into digital. And the truth is, in the history of of what we know with global crises, if we think back to the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, what we saw was actually that those brands that you know didn't pause their marketing budgets and reallocated them though to uh, digital spend is, instead were able to profit three times more than those brands that waited until after the crisis to pass uh, to restart their businesses. So again, I think there is an opportunity here for us to continue to connect with our customers and the digital world absolutely offers that opportunity. So let's take a look at those customers and you know talk a little bit about them. You know, we we've said for a while that brands need to to balance this kind of new customer with the the old customer. And what I mean by that is, you know, the older generations, the baby boomers, the generation X they used to have the spending powder, power and they would have the higher part of that disposable income. But we know is that younger generations, so millennials and Gen Z, or Gen Z as we say, say in the States, um, are actually increasing in their spending power. And what's super interesting is actually they are increasing their influence over those baby boomers and Generation X. So what that means is that we need to consider both of these customers as we're doing marketing. You know, even if the baby boomers and the Gen X 
uh, generations no longer have, no longer are the largest population segment, they're still quite popular. So it's a balancing act between the new and the old customer to be successful. And with that, one other silver lining we've seen in this pandemic that, again, nobody could have expected is this idea of, you know, digitization impacting these older customers. And what I exactly mean by that is, you know, most of you can re can imagine and can remember, you know, technology has caused a lot of disruption when it comes to consumption of media, when it comes to uh procurement when it comes to purchase habits you know just in the last few months we've seen more growth in e-commerce than we have in a decade it's incredible and um, and i think a lot of people would have assumed that you know older generations would be harder to adapt to that concept of you know maybe online shopping or even i love this this stat that we have up on the screen but social media consumption. And the truth is, is this has been something no one could have predicted, but the pandemic actually in this digitization process helped force older generations to kind of get online and start consuming more um, through the digital process, whether it was e-commerce or it was this social media consumption. I mean, if you look at these numbers, 42% increase in social media consumption for baby boomers and Gen X versus 62% for millennials and Gen Z is actually actually not far off. So it's an exciting moment to see both the older and gener older and younger generations getting in on this kind of new age technology. But what that means is that as we continue to market to these two generations that you know, there's more and more touch points to reach them, which is exciting, but challenging, right? You know, we know that there are three times more touch points than ever before. And now with everybody being part of this digital revolution, it means that we need to really think strategically about every single touch point for each generation, right? The, a different message for each generation at each different point. It's a little overwhelming. So, um, you know, if you were ever worried about being a marketer in the pandemic, I don't know if you should, because now there's actually double the work for us to do. You know, not only are there more touch points, but even when you think of the individual touch points like social media, there are so many different types of social media, for example. And um, when you think of influencers, there are so many different types of influencers and every single one of these touch points needs their own strategy. And, you know, as a CMO, I am tasked with these different questions, right? Should I, uh, should my team invest in influencer marketing or should we invest in owned media? And when we invest in owned media, should we be looking at Instagram? Should we be looking at new channels like TikTok? Or should we, we be investing more in Weibo or WeChat? But the truth is, is that it's so complicated because the tools that we use in the West aren't the tools that they use in the East. And the truth is a good CMO to understand exactly what's performing and what's not needs tools that are going to help you decipher what's what and how you're performing season after season versus how your competitors are doing. So Forrester says that $120 billion will be invested in digital marketing by 2021. And if you consider that's just the U.S. alone, if we think worldwide, it's at least double that. And, and that's a, it feels like a big number, especially considering smarter CMOs and smarter marketers aren't spending as much on digital marketing as they had to in the past because they know what works and they can spend those dollars in a much more efficient way. But even with all of this money floating out there in the world, the truth is that many of us will, will not see that for 2021. The reason being, of course, again, is that budgets are being cut. Brands are trying to you know, be conservative about their spend because people don't know when this pandemic is going to end. So what that means for us as marketers is that we need to be building smarter initiatives with smaller budgets. And that's the new normal. I guess I would say, you know, that means that ROI and efficiency are going to be the most important thing when you're thinking about, you know, which initiatives are working, which initiatives you should be investing in, and even looking at what your competitors are doing, figuring out with all of these budget restrictions and demands of ROI and efficiency, again, how are you going to stand out? How are you going to differentiate yourself? Most people then say, okay, well, we have small amounts of money, so let's just focus on pushing product, making sales, and generating revenue. But the truth is, is that 
customers now more than ever, they want to feel attached to a brand. They want to feel that emotional connection with who you are and what you represent. So with that in mind, brands cannot think short term, they have to think long term. And I love this quote, it's from an interview with the CEO of Montclair and I believe the Financial Times. And he says, the biggest risk I can see today for a company is making choices that can damage brand perception in an effort to anxiously recover revenues. I am not willing to make long term a long term vision hostage to a short term mindset. And I think he is completely right. You know, brand building, brand building exercises are a long term investment. So whilst we can't meet physically in public together, whilst we can't attend fashion shows physically in one room, we still as brands need to invest in brand building and building that emotional connection with our customer because that's what's going to linger far beyond this pandemic. And that's what's really going to drive your brand performance to help you stand out. So let's continue on to the benchmarking. You know, in my opinion, there are so many touch points. There are so many ways to talk to the consumer. There's so little budget to do it that you really need to think even more strategically about this concept of benchmarking. And when I say benchmarking, what I'm talking about is not just how you stand out from your competitors, but how you stand out from yourself. And that's what brings me to this co concept of efficiency. I love, I, I love this uh, idea of thinking about, you know, not just how you compete against your competitors, but how you compete against your capabilities. And that's why this brand efficiency diagram really resonates with me, because it allows me to see, you know, how efficient my team is working. We have some brands that we work with that focus, for example, an e-commerce fashion brand we work with. Their main goal of PR is to drive people to the website to click and purchase. So they're looking to have a high volume of placements that perhaps have low value because they're all shopping stories. But the truth is, is that, you know, that's not everyone's strategy. And understanding what works for you is exactly what benchmarking is all about. You know, we have other clients that are also in the luxury e-commerce space, and they're less focused on shopping because they care about building a bigger brand story. So when we look at them on the diagram, they're typically lower placements, but higher value per placement. And that's where you have to really understand the balance between competing against your competitors and competing against your capabilities. Why is benchmarking important? Well, the value of benchmarking, while it can't be summed up just in one slide, these are some of the points that I think are valuable. First, analyzing your performance and the performance of your competitor in an unbiased perspective. This is so, so hard for so many brands and so many executives because they already think someone's better than them or they think they're better than someone else, but data actually doesn't have any favorites. It just tells the truth. The second, detect the voices and channels that are best and plan accordingly. You can't just go on emotion, you have to go on what actually the data says. So just because everyone's jumping on a new channel doesn't mean you need to be there. Identifying industry trends and react faster to evolutions and new opportunities on the market. You know, the concept of this digital fashion show was huge over the last season, and some people thought that was the only way to go, but actually, in the end, we saw that brands that did physical and digital perform the best. So again, understanding what the industry trends are and then adapting them to your own strategy. Amplifying and sharing results, good and bad. So, so key. I think a lot of times brands are anxious or happy to share positive results, but no one talks about the bad results. And the truth is, if you don't know what's not working, you can't fix it. So make sure you understand what's working and what's not working. And then dig into competitor strategies. So understanding what your competitors are doing and how you can do it better. All right, so I said before, there's so many channels, so many touch points. How do you compare apples to oranges? At Launchmetrics, we believe you need one currency. The currency we use is media impact value. Media impact value, or MIV, assigns one singular metric to every single post, article, or interaction. So whether it's Weibo or WeChat in Asia, or Instagram or TikTok in the US, or even print media or an influencer campaign, you can understand how that's performing 
across all touch points, across all voices, and across all markets. Voices is the other concept that's quite special to launch metrics. We believe that there are five voices that impact the customer journey, from awareness to retention, and you can see them on my screen. Celebrities, media, influencers, partners, and owned media. So let's dig into a real world example when we think of benchmarking and what's important. Here we have data from fall, winter 19 and SS20 for fashion shows from around the world. We can see I've pulled the top five of shows from each season and in a normal kind of very superficial way of benchmarking, you can see Chanel was first the first season, Versace was uh, first the second season. But the truth is, is if you wanna know how you're performing and if you wanna know what works, you need to look far beyond those initial numbers. So first you wanna understand in general, what's that strategy? How are you competing? What's the playing field with your competitors? You know, if I just looked at who was top five for fall, winter 19, I noticed that Chanel was number one, Dior was number two. If I dug deeper beyond those initial numbers, I'd see Dior was just number two by a small margin. So understanding why did Chanel beat Dior is quite key for someone that works at Dior. I can see here that Chanel had 42% of its media impact value from media. But the truth is when you dig deeper into what that was, it was the season right after Carl Lagerfeld passed away and a lot of the media was talking about Carl, not necessarily about the newest collection or things that perhaps would help drive sales. So as a marketing expert, I need to really understand what's the strategy, what's the playing field, and what are the voices that my competitors are using and are they really using them better than me? You know, in this day and age, we say content is king. And another really important key aspect, again, when drilling into these voices and drilling into these strategies is understanding how your content competes against your competitors. So if you just look at those top five brands from fall, winter 19, you'd see that actually Victoria Beckham had 37% of the share of voice for own media. And if you just looked at that from a bird's eye view, you'd think, oh, she did better than Dior. I mean, most of us know Victoria Beckham, the celebrity and the brand, and fortunately for them, they reap the benefits when it comes to media impact value of sharing the same social handles. So of course, always when we look at their data, their own media is quite strong compared to others. That said, let's compare maybe Dior to Gucci, who Gucci also had a higher share of voice when it came to owned media. Gucci is also known for having this kind of cult-like following when it comes to its own media channels. But if I dug deeper into the, those numbers, while Dior had maybe a lower share of voice than Gucci did, the share of value, so that number, that currency, was actually higher. And if we look at kind of digging down into the posts and what posts drove those share of value, and we saw that the number one post Gucci had for fall, winter 19 was worth $162,000 in media impact value, while Dior's top post was worth 238,000 in media impact value. And it just skyrockets from here if you look at their numbers from last season. So again, how do you compete against your competitors when you drill down into that strategy? Then before we sign off, I wanna give a few examples about how you can compete against your own capabilities. You know, in today's day and day in age, amplifying your own message is key when you think of you know how you've done before and how you're gonna do it again. I'm gonna give you a pre-pandemic example and then explain how it relates to post-pandemic. You know, this is the infamous show with JLo walking on a, the Versace runway, uh, wearing her Break the Runway dress. I'm sure most of you are familiar or you've heard about it, but 20 years ago, this dress broke the internet and inspired Google to launch Google Images. And um, Versace has been doing an amazing job these last few years with essentially, connecting with their consumers, so thinking beyond the runway, thinking beyond the insular fashion community and trying to connect with consumers through their fashion show and using it as a platform for that. So what they were able to do is they got all those people into the room for, fa for their fashion week and stunned them by having JLo come out in her break the runway dress or break the internet dress. All of them were talking about it, posting about it, creating some noise, people back home, media that didn't even attend, started posting about it and sharing it with their readers. JLo herself posted about it. And that, of course, influenced the customers to start talking about it. 
And all of these different activities created this incredible echo that garnered three, uh, 32 million in media impact value for not just JLo, but also Versace. And what that reminds us is that amplifying your own message is key. And in a pandemic or post-pandemic wor world, it means if we're not meeting in person and these people aren't physically coming to my show to take pictures of JLo or to talk about it and take pictures of the runway, um, I need to create this amplification strategy by myself before the event happens. And we saw a lot of great brands like Dior and Miu Miu who actually thought, thought about this strategically for their past uh, show this September. And that's why they play so high when we looked at their media impact value. So don't forget, think about your own message and how you're going to amplify it. And I know we're getting close to the top of the hour, so one last example. You know, I said before, what's great about uh, benchmarking and benchmarking against yourself is that you need to look at the good and the bad. And here's a great example of why you have to look at not just the good, but also the bad or the ugly. You know, you need to think about what voices aren't working hard enough for you. And if we take this example from Balmont, we can see that just looking at what wasn't working before, Balmont was able to use new voices like celebrities and influencers to jump from 20th place in fall, winter 19 to fourth place in spring, summer 20. I mean, incredible. If we look at this post here uh, that Kylie Jenner did, it represents 24% of the total media impact value for the fall, winter 19 show. Can you imagine that just one singular post can drive so much media impact value? And really, this collaboration between the two, Balmont and Kylie Jenner, was just a home run for the brand. So again, think about what's not working for you and make a change and make it work. My wrap up for you is in today's day and age, we want to stand out in the crowd. So how you can stand out, how you can benchmark yourself against your competitors and your capabilities is understanding how value-based activities increase your brand's performance. You know, don't think about just pushing product, but connecting with that audience. Define which voices resonate most for your brand and engage with those who aren't working hard enough. Think about Kylie for Balmont. Target the impact your marketing strategy has on various business regions and make data-driven decisions. Think about you know, what channels are working better, what channels aren't working, and making sure you're measuring apples to apples, not apples to orange, oranges. And organize team goals and monitor your progress with measurable results. Remember, it's not a feeling marketing. You have to have data to support how you feel. If we all just went on gut instinct, you know, half the time we'd be right, but half the time we'd be wrong. So I hope this has been informative. Please let me know if you have any questions. Um, and I'm excited for this kind of hot seat I might be in if I haven't run out of time. Hello, Allison. Thank you for that. Thank you for everybody listening. Unfortunately, we are short on time, but we'll do one question. Um, so if I may, it's a question that we've gathered from our social networks. What advice do you have for brands looking to make better investments in their marketing strategy? Um, I guess I would say that you don't have to do everything. I know I said customers are, are expecting brands to engage with them at every point of the journey, but the truth is it's better to do one thing amazing instead of two things terrible. So look at you know where your customer is, where you're gonna get the most, as we say in America, bang for your buck, um, and really invest in the voices that are going to be the strongest for you. I mean, a lot of people think influencer marketing is like hot and cool and that's what they should invest in, but the truth is, is for example, if you don't invest in your owned media channels first and have a strong social media game, Influencers don't want to represent you. You know, owned media is your calling card. It's the business card that shows you to the outside world in the in this digital age. So think about you know how you can most effectively invest your dollars and pick that strategy and go with it. Fantastic. Well, that was all really great, and we had some great examples as well talking about the past fashion weeks. We saw a bit from Dior, which was unintentional because now following on the next session, we'll be hearing from Dior. Um, um, to continue, um, which honestly wasn't even planned. So um, for those of you who have signed up to the session, you should have a link in your email to join. For those of you who haven't signed up yet, you still have a quick few minutes to connect, log in, get the uh, credentials and do so. Um, so I'll see you all in the next session. And thank you again, Allison, for joining us. And thank you for those of you who are joining us uh, at the Performance Summit.
Great. Thank you guys so much. Cheers. See you soon.